I wanted to talk about new directions that I think uh, psychedelics are going in and to give a big broader view of um, where I think we're going rather than being his historical, this is like, a, I suppose, prehistorical. On the, on the slide, I want to boast a bit that I've been sort of looking around at the psychological area and saying, what are all these pieces? And we put them together. What kind of puzzle do we get out of them? Um, Michael uh, Winkleman and I edited the two-volume set, Psychedelic Medicine. And Ben and Michael and I are going to be doing two more volumes. Um, we're working on them now for religious uh, background, I edited Spiritual Growth with Theogens, which came out of a conference that Bob Jesse and I organized in 1995. My main interest as an educational psychologist is how to develop the human mind fully. The main ideas of educational psychology are what is the fullest development of the human mind and how do we reach it? And Psychedelic Horizons and the Psychedelic Future of the Mind start to answer that question. And then two years ago, a friend of mine who was a specialist in religion and psychedelics edited this book called Psychedelic Policy Quagmire. So I'll be calling on those. And um, this is the main picture that I want to show of the main idea that I see we're going on. This is the, the sequence that I think we'll be going through. Down at the bottom, forming a, a good, strong basis and foundation, of course, is what most of this meeting and most of MAPS meetings and most meetings are about which is the medical uses of psychedelics. And we have the biology, neurosciences, and psychotherapy as forming the base of the future that will be evolving. Now, one of the things, as we know, with the psychedelics as uh, psychotherapy, they often produce experiences of intense, uh, uh, intensity that are often interpreted as being sacred or theological. And that's where the entheogens come in. So in the entheogens, the eugenic use of psychedelics emerges from the medical use. In my own use, we can discuss this later if you want, I reserve the word entheogen for the spiritual, medical, or spiritual, religious use of psychedelics. I don't use it as a synonym for psychedelic. But sac sacredness is not the only thing that emerges when we start having psychedelic experiences. And these move us up to an idea I call ideogens, that a psychedelics promote and gender ideas. And I'll be talking largely about this level, the idea gen level, and also the mind design level, which will end this. So I see this is the progress that we're going through. Now, I haven't paid attention to the, either the arts or the recreational use of psychedelics. So keep in mind that those are all off to the side. So let's go ahead. Um, this is the main topic of, of the talk, neuro-based artificial intelligence. Now, when we think of artificial intelligence, we think of digital artificial intelligence. I'm going to propose a new use of that word to apply to intelligence based on the neural system. Now, I'll be talking about the neural system and brain. Actually, I should include the whole body, including the GI tract and everything else. So when I use brain or neuro, I really mean the whole body. And this allows us to produce a parallel track of, of uh, of artificial intelligence based on the neural sciences, not on the electronic sciences. And eventually, we'll get to what I call mind design. Mind apps is the main idea to start with. If you remember anything, please remember this idea of mind apps. It's a very simple idea, but it has fruit that goes in lots of different directions. And it's a very simple idea that digital apps are to devices as mind apps are to mind. That is, just as we can write and install a large number of digital apps in our devices, we can create and install a large number of mind apps in our minds. And those include psychedelic mind apps, but lots more. And it's this lots more that we'll be looking at. Throughout this talk, I'll be starting with some particular and then generalizing out of it to a larger field, basically by asking, this is an example of what larger class of things a what larger group of things. And, does, and those of you who are writing and doing research, you always want to ask your question, does this information, the thing I'm applying, apply not just to the particulars I'm looking at, but does it apply to the whole group that this is a, and one example of? So let's take a look at mind apps. And remember, we are largely in the business here and the interest of installing 
mind apps, but there are lots of other mind apps out there. We're familiar with this, and this raises an interesting question. If there's this difference between placebo and psilocybin in the parts of the brain that are connected, what are the other possibilities of designing, of showing, of discovering other connections for other mind apps? In other words, this is the connection of the psilocybin mind app. What about the connection of all the other psychedelics, of the non-psychedelic psychoactive drugs, of meditation, hypnosis, dreaming, the martial arts, and yoga? These are also <coughs> mind apps, and they are likely to produce additional diagrams of what part of the brain is connected with what other part, and it's not only what is connected, but it's the power of the connection. As you can see, some of the lines are quite weak, some of the lines are quite strong. So those are also other patterns of connections that are likely to evolve as we move away from psychedelics into a larger view of the human mind and how to generate it. There are four slides that have an unfortunate largely large number of words in them. And my apologies for this. Um, each time we arrive at them, I'll, rather than read them to you, I'll give you 10 seconds to skip around, let your unconscious tell you what to look at, and then we'll move on to the next slide. So this is some of the world of mind apps. The apps that, in addition to psychedelics, are also there. So let's take 10 seconds and just let your mind pick out what you want to. Time's up, bing. I want to point out two things. You notice, uh, the, I have one that says placebo effect, effect is crossed out and ability. Because obviously the placebo effect cannot be a, uh, attributed to something that is chosen because it has no effect. There's a logical problem there. However, if we talk about placebo ability, we got to ask the question, how does the placebo ability vary from mind-body state to mind-body state? And we'll see that question arising. Finally, the, the neural discoveries. Every time something is discovered about how our brain works, that's a potential lead on developing a new mind app to influence the brain using that information that's just been discovered. So every time you see something being new about the brain, remember this can be developed or might be developed into a new mind app. <clears throat> One of the advantages of this is that there's one of the definitions of intelligence is increasing the repertoire of cognitive, emotionally, emotional, and bodily processes. This is what the mind apps do, each one with its own cognitive, emotional, and bodily processes. So by inventing and installing mind apps, we are in the position of increasing human intelligence We'll hit this from another angle in another couple of slides. <coughs> the single state fallacy um, is the erroneous assumption that all worthwhile thinking takes place only in our default mind-body state. This is the main error that's made in philosophy and mind studies now. Uh, I call it the single fallacy, single state fallacy, for a very particular reason. If you go to a professor and say, well, you left out information about psychedelics and hypnosis and meditation, blah, 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 they'll say yes. But if you accuse them of a fallacy, this is something you do not want to be accused of. So what this, what this does is, is a sort of threaten people who are multi-state people by saying they're committing a, committing a fallacy. So this is a, very, this is a sort of a political educational phrase. So what happens then, as we develop a theory of the human mind that includes all the mind apps, not just psychedelic ones, but over on the right-hand line uh, are a list of them, and there are a lot more. This is a diagram of an idea, if it were more accurate, there would be lots and lots and lots more pieces of the pie. So in addition to the psychedelic mind apps, we've got dreaming, breathing techniques, meditation, and these are not just one or two mind apps, but there are lots of types of meditation, lots of breathing techniques, lots of types of yoga. So actually, the, each one of these pie pieces would be divided into lots of little slices. And each one of those um, is a mind app. Uh, 
<clears throat> I don't use the word state of consciousness to describe what the mind apps do, but mind-body state. And that's because consciousness is used with such ambiguity that people use the word, they think they're talking to somebody else who uses the word, but they're very different kinds of meanings. Let's give an example. Suppose the people over in this part of the room think of consciousness as being awake. Last night I was unconscious and now I'm awake. George was in a coma and now he's conscious again. Up in the upper part of the room, suppose we have people who think consciousness as meaning what's on somebody's mind. Jill has strong ecological consciousness. Consciousness of money represents Bill's more view of the human mind. See, there's a different view there. Up in the corner are some spiritual people, and they think of consciousness being level of spiritual development. So George had a mystical experience with psychedelics, and his level of spiritual development rose. He is now at a higher, quote, level of consciousness. You see the problem with these words. And in the middle, we've got the political sociolo sociology people who talk about women's consciousness and proletarian consciousness, meaning the thoughts and feelings one has because of one's place in society. And over here, finally, are the psychologists, and they fall into two camps. One is they think of consciousness as being the things that we're aware of from moment to moment in our minds. Right now, the things you're thinking, seeing me, hearing my voice, and that is the, quote, stream of consciousness. And finally, over in the corner, we have people who think about a mind, think of a state of consciousness as being a mind-body state. Now, this is Charlie Tart's view, and rather than using Tart's view, altered state of consciousness, I prefer mind-body state because I don't want to get the word consciousness as I use it, confused with everybody else's use of the word consciousness. It's just a tactical word. And you'll notice, mind-body does not have a hyphen in it. So I'm not seeing mind and body as two separate things, closely aligned, and the little hyphen aligns them. But I'm pulling out the hyphen and seeing mind-body state as one overall state. So it includes going on in, quote, mind things and body things. So we're talking about mind-body states, meaning approximately what Charles Tart means by state of consciousness. Residence is it's a very powerful word and it's really pretty obvious that everything that we do is a result of the mind-body state we're in. I mean, our thoughts, our feelings, our bodily processes, okay, our, ex uh, our experiences, our expressions of our mind-body state. Now, that's obvious, but what is less obvious is the questions that this lets us ask. The question that largely this group maps and Hefter are interested in are, how does psychotherapy vary from our default mind-body state to psychedelic states, right? And that's the, that's the big question we're looking at and collecting information on. But now let's move that up a level and ask this version of the question. How does blank vary from mind-body state to mind-body state? So it's not just from our default state to a psychedelic state, but from any of these mind-body states that apps produce to other mind-body states. And this gives us <clears throat> an enormous question that I call the central multi-state question. And we can apply this across the board in the humanities, the social sciences, and in allied fields. So the, the big question that comes out of this is, how does or do blank vary from mind-body state to mind-body state. So take whatever you're interested in and plug it in there. And what you've done is just develop, I was going to say an agenda, but several agendas of research. Because everything you get to look at, you look at in all mind-body states. And remember that pie chart with all those pieces of pie and they're divided into little slices. That question to be asked for every individual slice in there. Not only that, but the strength. In psychedelics, you might get one question for microdosing, another question for a psychotherapeutic, psychoanalytic <clears throat> dose, and another for the outright, boom away, psychedelic peak experience of folks. So these questions just blow the roof off the social sciences and the humanities, because all these questions get re-asked for every mind-body state <clears throat> that can be produced by every mind app that's around. So let's look at some of these. I was really amazed when I first put this up on screen. I didn't know the, 
the, uh, the finger was going to um, was going to move. I thought I was sticking it in my eye, but I, I don't think I'm not too proud to place with this. So, in brief, multi-state theory <coughs> is built on the single-state fallacy. We use the the idea of mind-body state rather than state of consciousness. Now, other people may continue to use the word state of consciousness. I'm just stipulating for this this use. I want to use mind-body state. So, don't feel you're somehow bad, or I think you're bad, if you're using the word consciousness. But please do be clear. If you're a philosopher and you want to talk about self-reflection, please say, by consciousness, I mean the ability to think and think about our thinking. Okay. So, mind apps. This is the, the big fertile idea here that results in these ideas. Residents, we just saw. And we'll get to mind design um, in a couple of slides. Now, I want to look at some uses of this idea sort of across the intellectual fields. And these are just some little samples to give you an idea of how we think feels. <clears throat> this great um, illustration comes from the psychopharmacology of LSD. And um, this, again, is one of the 10-second um, things. So take 10 seconds and bounce around from these various ovals. Bing. <clears throat> Emergence is one of the ideas I find most interesting and challenging in the sciences. And this is how do new qualities emerge when things are put together in new combinations. And the one that everybody talks about is hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. You put them together, you get water, and you got all those watery qualities that neither hydrogen nor oxygen has. What's going on here? Also, I think we need a a parallel idea that I call demergence, because some of the qualities of the contents, the individual parts, disappear during the combined part. So we have to look at the qualities of oxygen and hydrogen as gas, as I'd like to call demerging. Now the big question we're looking at here, one of them, is brain plus the default mind apps, that is the one most of us are in most of the time, produces our usual mind-body state, our default mind-body state. So that's very interesting. So this gives us a way of looking at emergence, both at the oxygen-hydrogen level and the brain and default level. Now, what happens when we recognize that the brain can be loaded not only with our default mind apps, but with all those other mind apps, all the little slices of the pieces of the pie. And this will give us other mind-body states. Now, this, this is, there's a, a question called the hard question. And the hard question is, how does consciousness emerge from biology, from the brain? David Chalmers has called this the hard question. <clears throat> I want to ask the harder question and maybe the impossible question. Are there general rules of emergence that apply all the way from oxygen and hydrogen up through what we would call human consciousness and cognition? I don't think we're going to make any progress in that. I think it's too hard. But on the other hand, because we can have new, new examples of emergence just by putting our brain together with these new mind-body states, we'll have a larger sample to draw on rather than just our ordinary awake consciousness. So we'll have a lot of examples of emergence and can use that as a way of studying emergence and can actually do experimental studies in emergence. Let's go a step further on this. Consilience is one of my other favorite topics. This is the idea of putting together all the scientific facts and theories into one overwhelming scaffold of ideas. And then we all know, you start off with physics and eventually you get up to chemistry and that'll take you into biology and so forth and so forth. Psychedelics are uniquely qualified to look at the question of consilience and it's possible to do experimental consilience with psychedelics. Let me give you an example. We put in a molecule down here at a biological level, and up at the top, we get these high-level concepts that uh, seem to appear. Now, what's going on here? How does the molecule result in portent, truth, reality, sacredness, beauty, goodness, and gratitude? What's the mechanism that's, uh, mechanisms that are going on between the molecule and these high-level abstractions? 
I'm curious in, in this group, I'd like you to help me do a little bit of research. I'd like to go down this list on the right side and see how many people have had these experiences um, sort of one by one. Portent is the feeling, the intu intuition, that something great is about to happen. There's an impending, very important thing. Can I see your hands? How many people felt that? A lot of portent people, okay? How about truth? And this is the idea, this is true. This is really true. This is truer than true. Yeah, even more true, okay? How about reality? This is really real, okay? Right? You know everybody knows that one, okay? Sacredness. A sense of blessedness, sacredness, holiness, okay? Again, lots of hands. Beauty, yeah. yeah, oh yeah. I first heard music for the first time, thanks to psychedelics. I had no idea music could be so beautiful. And I expect uh, most of the people in this room have had that experience. A goodness, a sense that this is emotionally good. It's a high level. And finally, gratitude. How did this happen to me? What did I do to do it right? See, now, now, these things are coming out of putting molecules in at a low level, and they're emerging at a higher level. This really leads, deserves, deserves to be looked at. And psychedelics and other mind-body psychotechnologies allow us to do experiments in this, so we can have experimental consilience studies. Now let's do a, a brief touch on the humanities. Here's one for philosophy. Here's good old, I think, therefore I am. Now, I is a variable in different mind-body states, okay? So the philosopher is himself or herself a variable. The I who thinks is not set. That can be changed. Transpersonal psychology is a wonderful example of that. Ego transcendence, the things that most people in this room are familiar with have had shifts in the sense of I. Think, well, we know there are lots of cognitive variations in different mind-body states. So that, that will allow us to ask the question, how does thinking variable? Therefore, how does logic vary from mind-body state to mind-body state? And am, how does, ex how does existence happen? In, in psychocriticism, I want to recommend the work of Stan Groff, uh, his view of the human mind is the most complex that I know of that comes out of psychedelics. Although, as a psychoanalyst, he is largely interested in people who've had problems. And one of the uses of Groff's psychotherapy is uh, as a way of interpreting work arts and individual, just as there is Freudian and there is Jungian psycho psychocriticism, there is Groffian psychocriticism. And there have been at least half a dozen different little studies in that. Joseph Campbell came up with the idea of the hero with a thousand faces. The hero, the, the hero is somebody who faces a demon, faces a fear, and comes back with something of value to the world. This often happens during psychedelic experiences, and I think we've got a new cadre of heroes, and these are the people who develop and explore different mind-body states. So many of them are in this room. Historically, they're people like Stan Groff, um, Timothy Leary, the, the, the McKenna brothers, and so they are our new heroes who have gone forth into the jungles of the unconscious and come back with new views of the human mind. So we have a new hero for this millennium. These are some hidden nuts, nuts from the experimental humanities. The studies that have been done in psychotherapy often come up with topics that are of value to people in the humanities. I won't take you one of these 10 second events here. Um, these slides are online and um, I'll give you the address in the very last slide. But just open-mindedness, mystical experiences, memories, um, all those things are of value to humanists, not just to people who are doing psychotherapy. Finally, cognitive enhancement. We know there's been one Nobel Prize that came out of the ability to think during a psychedelic state. It did not occur during the psychedelic state. Um, uh, we'll talk more about problem solving and psychotherapy from Jim Fadiman's book. I recommend his book as the best approach to problem solving with psychedelics. It includes not only the study that was published in 1966, but excerpts from the reports of the people who were the subjects who were in that 
and this is the only place that information is available. Finally, I want to talk about cognitive enhancement. Usually when we think about cognitive enhancement, we mean the ability to solve our ordinary problems in our ordinary default state. It's also possible to propose new paradigms, hypotheses, and ideas, and we'll get to mind-body states in just a minute. Benny Shannon, who's a cognitive psychologist at Hebrew University, wrote a wonderful book called Antipodes of the Mind. He went a bit on a vacation to Brazil, and you can guess the next steps. He got interested in what does cognitive psychology have to say about ayahuasca experiences, and what do ayahuasca experiences have to say about cognitive psychology? So every one of these mind-body states and mind apps will have something to say about our minds. And um, what, what Shannon did is actually developed a new paradigm um, for cognitive psychology based on his ayahuasca experiences. So, this, so has he stumbled on a way of developing, inventing new paradigms. This is one example of it, and are there other examples? Finally, on mind design, here's our pie chart again. You notice over on the left-hand side, ingredients for inventing new mind-body states. This is the gigantic idea. Can we invent new mind-body states? For example, could we take transcranial stimulation, electromagnetic stimulation, combine it with your favorite, favorite psychoactive drug, and result in a new mind-body state? That is one that has not been experienced before. We can take these pieces of pie as ingredients for constructing mind-body states that have never been experienced before. And finally, on the lower one, we see how it's possible to um, combine these in an absolutely unending series of recipes. Well, thank you.